And now for another perspective on the whole problem. We're weaving around rather deliberately different perspectives on safety because it's got, it needs to be addressed from very many areas. And one of the features of healthcare is that so many processes and systems and pieces of technology have evolved, sometimes in good ways, but often in unexpected ways. And one of the great pleasures of working with Jeremy, who is director of the Helen Hamlin Center of the role of design in safety, is to see designers just looking at a problem absolutely freshly. And this has been a revelation to me, and I'm gonna say no more than that, except what a pleasure it is to have Jeremy here to tell us about this. Well, thank you very much. Um, in case you're wondering uh, why somebody from the Royal College of Art is part of Charles's network, um, I, th I feel I ought to, uh, I owe you an explanation. Um, and tell you a little bit about the Royal College of Art. Uh, we're 175 years old. We're just across the park, uh, next door to the Albert Hall. We're entirely postgraduate, um, so we teach all the design disciplines, 70% of what we do. Although we have a great fine art school, painting and sculpture and so on, uh, we're mainly about design. Uh, we teach vehicle design, fashion, product design, communication, architecture and so on. A lot of the disciplines that you will find in healthcare systems um, and uh, this I just want to show you is the, um, this is what happens after medical error. Um, this is a funeral carriage. Uh, it was designed for the Duke of Wellington in 1852 by Royal College of Art students. And um, uh, Charles Dickens wrote at the time, he said it was the most hideous thing he'd ever seen. And uh, as it went down the mall with the grand old Duke's body inside, the wheels came off. And uh, the body slithered into the road, and it was, set, it was a group of sailors who put him back in the carriage. And at that time, the governors of the Royal College of Art decided that, as well as the decorative artists being trained, we needed a few engineers. Um, so ever since then, design has been quite a, uh, an important thing. Um, flash forward to the early 60s, and uh, we had a very big program. We have a bit of a heritage in healthcare design. Uh, we worked, uh, we had about 20 PhDs at the college under Bruce Archer, who was a great guru of design thinking, working on the, the King's Fund bed. And it's still the standard bed that's in use in hospitals today in, in a lot of places. Um, the story of my centre um, begins in 1991 with Helen Hamlin, who I know funds a lot of uh, very interesting research around Imperial. Um, she set up, she's an, uh, an alumna of the Royal College of Art, and she set up um, a centre for, uh, first of all, it was called Design Age. It was looking at the design implications of an ageing population. And very quickly, uh, the, the needs of a safer, more efficient, more innovative healthcare system came right to the fore. And in, uh, a few years later, this uh, action research programme morphed into the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design. Uh, we have three labs within the centre, and they're all kind of interconnected. We have our original lab, which is about age and ability. Um, we have our health and patient safety lab, and Ed Matthews is here, uh, who leads that lab. And we have one on work and city. But they're all dealing uh, around a people-centered approach to design. And um, we're particularly uh, focused on patient safety. Um, and we've been, we've been working uh, since 2003 in the area of patient safety. Um, and we've been working with the National Patient Safety Agency on a whole series of, of, of work around, around packaging and labelling of, of drugs. We've worked on three separate design council uh, programmes with the Department of Health, doing design demonstrations around design bugs out, design for patient dignity, an accident and emergency uh, reducing violence. We work with private industry such as Depew, Johnson & Johnson. And we've also recently been working with Aradazi and with Charles uh, on a complete redesign of the London Ambulance of more later. So we have a wide range of projects. We look at patient safety uh, through a very, very particular uh, set of lenses. Um, they're all design-based lenses. Uh, one is through progressing policy. And I suppose the starting point um, was 2003 when uh, uh, Roger Coleman who was the uh, researcher with whom I set up the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design. He worked with Peter Buckle, and I think Peter Buckle is here, uh, at Surrey University, and with John Clarkson at Cambridge. And they wrote something called Design for Patient Safety, and it was very appropriately um, 
published by the Design Council in the shape of a blood bank. And the whole point of it was to say, you know, the NHS does not have the, uh, the, the systems in place like a large airline or a chemical company to manage risk and have a design management system um, that, that, that would look at these things holistically. And, and the report went to Liam Donaldson uh, and, and a lot of the work was, was, was then implemented. Um, we look at the lens of systems and services. One of the points about design is that it has a systems-led approach. Uh, and we develop products. We are an interdisciplinary group in the center of industrial designers, engineers, anthropologists, uh, and communication designers. Um, this is work we did um, with Imperial here at St. Mary's, looking at a redesign of the resuscitation trolley and uh, this is a trolley that breaks into three, so people aren't running around all the time. Um, and um, it's been through a clinical trial here at Imperial. Um, there's been a lot of discussion, and Bryony talked about it, the whole issue of managing medication. We're very, very interested in the design-based elements of how older people in particular uh, take or don't take uh, medication. And... We're also very interested in the communication skills of creating campaigns. This is work on the left we did with Help the Aged, funded by Toyota, uh, asking people, are they still in shape to drive? And trying to get older people to think about giving up driving. And on the right, um, uh, um, getting people to walk. Um, and the, these, were, these were schemes that were rolled out. Um, Behaviour change is a classic area for design, but uh, it's a very, very difficult one, and I'll come on to that a little bit. The key point of what I want to talk about today is, is around design thinking and design-led innovation. There is a growing sense, uh, uh, and there's a group of, of very strong advocates of what we do here at Imperial, there's a growing sense that design thinking has attributes and, and qualities and characteristics to it that could be very, very useful within a clinical setting. What do designers do? They don't generally gather big data. They don't gather um, uh, quantitative data sets and analyze them. They tend to go in depth with, with users, with people, and do very creative things with them, with small numbers of people, get, but get large numbers of outputs. They also build things and model things and prototype early and use their sketching and drawing and, and, and design capabilities um, to actually see whether things do or don't work. And these are very, very useful attributes. And I just give you a little bit of theoretical background to some of the case studies I'm going to show you. Um, in any, any company, any organization, whether it's a health provider or any type of organization, Everyone is trying to solve three things simultaneously. They're trying to produce something that is feasible, technically. They're trying to produce something that is viable, economically. And they're trying to produce something that is desirable, not just for the patient, but also for the clinician who's delivering, this, delivering the care. And I think that a lot of healthcare has thought very hard about technological feasibility and viability. Um, but the desirability of things... Uh, is often be missing. And that's where it comes in. And I don't mean design as a kind of good-looking thing, a beautifier uh, of processes, but actually functionally desirable, uh, fitness for purpose. And if you look at um, any innovation process, um, there are always four distinct phases. Uh, there's a discovery phase, often called the fuzzy front end, where people are trying to figure out what the issues are, what are the problems. Then there's a definition of the problem. And then there's a development phase where you come up with multiple solutions and, and evaluate them. And finally, you deliver a product or service um, in the context for which it's aimed. And this is a lot of medical engineering classically follows this. Designers have historically been at the back end of the process. You know, scientists and clinicians come out of the labs or come out of the hospitals and say, we've got this problem and we've come up with a solution. Let's find a designer to make it look nice or make it work a bit better. Actually, designers are moving because of globalization. And there are design studios in, in China and in India and, and, and the offshoring of manufacture. Designers have moved, especially industrial designers, to the front end of the innovation process, to the discover and define phase. 
And this is rare. This is, if there's one message I want you to take away today, is involve designers right at the end of the process, right at the fuzzy clinical beginnings of trying to define problems and develop solutions. And if I explore this a little bit more, uh, we often say that designers have their feet on the, on the floor, on the ground, but they have their head in the clouds. And, um, and that's for a very, very good reason. Um, if we take the phases and we look at them in a different way, and we look at between what currently exists and what could be created, and we introduce not just the real world, the concrete world we all know, but a world of ideas, a world of imagination, an abstract world, um, we can then begin to see the discover, define, develop, deliver phase in a, different, in a different way. What happens in conventional medical engineering, uh, which is clinically led, is that people observe and learn from the real world, isolate the problem, and then solve and realize and make it happen in the real world. They don't go on any kind of journey into the abstract where they synthesize and frame and say, well, what if we did this, or what if we did that? What if we transpose this? Um, there isn't that kind of... Uh, systems get fixed, and they're often temporary fixes. Uh, they aren't transformed. What designers do um, is go into the abstract world. They go on this journey. It's a little bit of a golden arc, and it's a very different way of thinking about the problem. So what are the characteristics or what are the characters that one needs for design-led innovation? Well, I would argue that um, there's a very good book by Tom Kelly uh, called Ten Faces of Innovation, and three of those faces are at the front. And I, I would argue that these three characters, the anthropologist, the experimenter, and the cross-pollinator, are all very, very important uh, characters uh, generically to a process of innovation in patient safety. Um, so let's take the anthropologist first. And this is Henry Dreyfus, one of the godfathers of American industrial <coughs> design. He designed the original Polaroid camera, the original John Deere tractor. And as a young man, uh, he worked with RKO, who were building picture palaces, uh, neon-drenched picture palaces, cinemas, all over uh, Depression America in the 30s. And they discovered that in, in cities, these, these cinemas were doing brilliantly. But in, in, in farming communities, um, they were doing very, very badly. No one would go in them, and they couldn't understand it. And he went to a farming community in Iowa and stood for four days watching people walking past and not going in until he got, he solved the problem. He ripped out the light-colored scarlet carpet, which was gorgeous and lush, and put a simple rubber mat there. And, and the next night, the cinema was full because he'd given them permission to cross the threshold, and they could wipe their muddy boots yeah. Uh, on this rubber mat. And, um, you know, he's the kind of godfather of, 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 of observational design and really watching how people behave. And, um, of course, uh, uh, we, we were involved in this project with the Design Council and the Department of Health about violence and aggression in, 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 in A&E. And I don't need to tell this audience, uh, there's often a clash between the needs of clinical care and the people who are running A&E and, and patient needs and this was very, uh, this study, which we worked on with Pearson Lloyd Designers, the Tavistock Institute, and a number of partners, what was interesting about it is we came up, we did a lot of observations and came up with perpetrator profiles. So people, people become violent and aggressive in A&E for different reasons. Sometimes they're stressed out of their box. Sometimes they're frustrated because somebody's come in after them and walked in front of them and they don't understand the process. Sometimes they're intoxicated on drugs and drink and, and, and so on and so forth. And we came up with a whole series of perpetrator profiles and we did very in-depth studies in London, uh, Southampton. Uh, London, um, London was on the South Bank. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the hospital. Uh, St. Thomas's, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, Southampton and Chesterfield and we did a whole load of uh, in-depth user engagement and we came up with a communication system that told people where they were in the process. There were apps on phones, there was graphics in the spaces, there was even in the top left you can see how busy or how quiet the A&E is, A &E is. And the idea was really to show people where they were in the process and what was going to happen to them. And you could send them an email even before they arrived in A&E. Um, and for staff, uh, we gave them uh, uh, perpetrator profiles 
uh, the, 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 you know, they could, they, could see, they could see the different types of people and, and they were given advice on how to avoid uh, potentially aggressive uh, solution, uh, ag aggressive situations. And there was an incident tally. There's a, there's a tremendous problem with recording incidents of, of aggression in A&E and there was a chance for people to record them properly so they could analyze the problems. Um, and it's all been put together in an A&E toolkit that's available on the Design Council website. So this is an example of design thinking where you're working in a really intense way with people and being very, very anthropological and observational and using what designers would call rapid ethnographic techniques. You don't need to spend six months with a New Guinea tribe. You can spend three days in an A&E community. And if you know what you're looking at, uh, that's important. The second attribute of design thinking is one which the provost of the RCA, James Dyson, uh, who's also a graduate, subscribes to. And this is, this is you know, fail fast to succeed sooner. Make lots of prototypes. Come up with ideas. He did over 500 prototypes of the um, Dyson dual cyclone vacuum cleaner before it worked. Over 500. Um, Thomas Edison was a great experimenter. Um, he, he apparently, um, he once said, you know, I found, you know, when he was trying to make the tungsten halogen bulb, he, he used over a thousand different pieces of material. And... Uh, um, what was incredible about that was, was uh, he said, um, I have not failed. I've merely successfully found a thousand things that do not work, um, <laughs> which was great. Uh, um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is some work from the Royal College of Art, what, uh, one of our student groups on, on Innovation Design Engineering, which is a joint course with Imperial. Uh, they produced a, a device to stop you um, for a first aid kit <laughs> to stop people swallowing their own tongues. It's called Tongue Sucker. Please don't put that into Google. Um, uh, um, uh, it has been manufactured. Um, but you can see the level of design experimentation with different shapes and materials. Um, and, and we've been working uh, with hospitals in, in the Bath and Bristol region and with the Bath Institute of Medical Engineering on the neck brace. And you know that there's a lot of potential for errors and problems around um, putting, uh, putting neck braces on spinal injury patients. And we've done a lot of 3D prototyping of different ideas, and we came up with a very interesting idea using a single folded sheet of uh, polypropylene, and, um, and you can see it being user-tested. And this idea of experimentation is incredibly uh, important. And here's the final design. We're now talking to manufacturers about licensing, and this design ability to work through lots of ideas at speed and test them and discard them if they don't work, um, rather than treating a prototype as a specification for a final product. And then the third element is cross-pollination, the idea of reframing the problem, transposing it. This is the air and chair, which in the early 2000s was the dot-com chair of choice and the best-selling office chair in America. I've got one. It's very comfortable. Um, the designers, uh, Chadwick and Stumpf, they didn't look to the furniture industry. They didn't. They reframed the problem in, in completely. They said, how can we make uh, a chair which people with severe lower back pain can sit in comfortably? They went to the aerospace industry. They found an aerofoil material and they took that into furniture. And this is transposing the idea. I'll just give you an example from our own work, um, you probably know, all know about this, where uh, scalp, dirty scalpels or missing instruments uh, cause operations to be cancelled. And we were approached by a company called Depew, a Johnson & Johnson company, and their business model was to give, free of charge, very expensive stainless steel instrumentation sets to surgeons doing, doing, doing knee surgery. And there were all kinds of problems with the delivery systems and the sterilization. And, and they said to us, you know, can you sort it out? Can you look at the trays? Could you redesign the stainless steel instruments to get rid of the, the crap traps and, you know, the problems over, 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 med over error and uh, safety? And we reframed the problem. We thought, well, what if we... Let, let's, what if they could just... Um, do, do an operation, and then throw away the instrument. 
and we use recycled plastic, we use injection molding techniques from consumer products, and we, by reframing it, um, uh, we, um, we were able to come up with a completely different solution, um, whereby it was a one-shot uh, use of instrumentation that when it was done, it was finished and it was gone. Um, we were told by Depew that, that the alpha male breed that are surgeons would never accept plastic instrumentation. Uh, but actually, you know, if you design it properly with the sufficient quality, um, uh, then it'll be a success. So I just want to conclude with a couple of very, very quick case studies um, uh, that pull all three strands together, <laughs> the, 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 the um, anthropological, the experimentation, and the idea of reframing the problem, the cross-pollination. So we worked with um, Charles and, and uh, with Raj Agwal um, and with George Hanna at Imperial on something called Dome, designing out medical error. We were looking at the bed space, and we pulled together data on medical errors that happened specifically in the bed space. So there's a lot of published incident data. There are a lot of observations. And we also, we did our in-depth designer ethnography stuff. And we did a lot of questionnaires for staff and patients. And we had a scoring system when we triangulated all that data. And we came up with the top five. We decided to design interventions for the top five uh, hazards. Hand washing, observations, monitoring of vital signs, <coughs> isolation of infection, medication delivery, and staff handover in the, the earlier presentation. Um, uh, that, uh, uh, that was done on, on, on checklists is very interesting because handover is a huge kind of error-prone area. Um, just to show you the kinds of thinking, um, on isolation of infection, we were very, very interested in the problems around, you know, uh, the medication locker was, was over, over out the way. Uh, uh, there was nowhere to put the sharps bin. Uh, gloves and aprons were out of the bed space, so anybody putting them on would have to go somewhere else. Um, and there was no flat surface for writing any notes. So we came up with a product which doesn't exist. This is not about fixing the existing system. It's trying to transform it with design thinking. We came up with uh, um, a, something called the care, care station, uh, the care center, and it has everything in one place. We used our prototyping skills, and we tested it in the simulation center here at Imperial. And um, we did a study analysis, a bit like Bryony, where you're seeing where, where a nurse is going to and from. Of course, with the care center, we were actually, they were actually spending more, running around a lot less, uh, and, and around they were closer to the patient for longer. And we've had it manufactured by Bristol Maine, and it's now available. Please buy it, because we're on a royalty. Um, <laughs> and... Um, and uh, it's got an integrated sharp spin. Um, as part of that project, we also looked at, um, we, came up with a generic, uh, uh, we came up with a generic system for hand washing. And there's a whole history in design of, of what, what is now called nudge economics, but it's been around forever, is using design techniques to change people's behavior. This is in Texas, where in the 1930s, they put a skull on people who'd had violations on their number plate. Uh, um, uh, I particularly like this one. Um, uh, um, it was very successful because, you know, uh, people were riding into this bridge. And I, I, I like this one. It was, uh, this is from the 1930s, in, only, in it, only in England. Um, and this, this is the stop... Stop young boys leaving their shirts out by putting lace around the edges. Um, the trouble is, that, as we know, is that uh, people just will not stay off the grass. And um, uh, this was shot by one of my research associates <laughs> in a hospital. I mean, when they put the hand dryer in, thinking they were going to improve patient safety, did they really think it was going to be a receptacle for hand towels? Um, and this is one of my favorites. This is actually in Schiphol Airport where they were spending so much on cleaning in the men's loo, because men are so inaccurate, um, that they put a fly in the sanitary well 
And people, you know, and all the men in, in the room will know that if you see a fly in the bowl, you will aim at it. And um, it improves it incredibly. I think you should introduce this at Imperial. Um, anyway, I just want to close with just a very, very, a couple of slides on redesigning the emergency ambulance. Um, uh, um, I don't need to tell this audience the problems with amb ambulances in terms of cleaning them, in terms of stocking them. Uh, as a working environment for staff, they're very problematic, uh, and patients find them intimidating. And we came up with a number of uh, uh, long-term design challenges, and this was funded by the uh, Regional Development Fund of the London NHS. So we did our observational stuff with rideouts. Um, we built an ambulance tank at the RCA, and these are two of my research associates, um, one from Mexico, one from Nigeria, uh, Yusuf Mohammed and Gian Paolo Fazari. And we built a life-size, the size of the Mercedes Sprinter interior out of cardboard. Uh, this is Dixie Dean, who was, a, um, who was a paramedic, worked on the project with us. She was seconded from the London Ambulance Service. And she had plenty to say about uh, how we should develop uh, the interior of, of, of a space in which she works all day. We did a link analysis of, of, of paramedics moving around the existing ambulance. And this was our new interior concept, 360 degree access to the patients, um, modular treatment packs that get put in just in time, uh, a digital diagnostic system. Um, the most exciting bit of the whole scheme was when we bid on eBay to buy an old um, Australian ambulance um, we got it for 450 quid. It was brilliant. Um, and we had a Formula One uh, um, uh, um, fabricators in Norfolk as a favor to us actually build a whole new interior. And there is the new interior. It has molded plastic uh, interior so you can wipe it down. It has a seat for um, family. It's got 360 degree access. It's got this... this, this better communication system and daylighting. Um, we did clinical evaluations. We've got a, collected a lot of data, which has been very successful. Um, and we used actors uh, in simulated uh, emergency scenarios and tested the speed and the time. Um, we used ultraviolet light to test for, 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 for um, bacteria. And there is Aradazi with Lady Hamlin and Peter Bradley, the, um, the head of the London Ambulance Service, um, uh, and, and Ed Matthews, who's here, um, uh, the proud unveiling of the emergency ambulance. We've won lots of awards. It combines uh, ethnographic um, experimentation and really trying to reframe the, the problem. Um, and uh, you can read more about it on our website. Thank you very much. I mean, the, the idea is that the plastic is <coughs> recyclable. Um, so you collect in bags the one shot, and they go back into the manufacturing process. Um, yes, uh, it's probably more environmental to have stainless steel things that last for years. Um, uh, there's often a conflict between some of the zero carbon aspirations of the NHS and, and, and the environmental aspects and the user-friendly aspects. Um, but we looked at whole issues of the whole life cycle of the product. And if you look at the ambulance, we've really taken into consideration um, that the average... Ambulances are very heavy currently because they are full. They're like, you know, they're full of kitchen cabinets for full of stuff for every eventuality, and then the paramedics are searching through. Um, 
the average speed of an ambulance in London is seven miles an hour. They're doing, sorry, they're doing seven miles to the gallon. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not very environmentally sustainable. So, you know, a lighter ambulance, a better stocked ambulance, I think that contributes to a lower carbon footprint. Uh, the, aim, the aim of design in the healthcare sector is to, is to reduce error and improve clinical performance and reduce patient fear and intimidation. I mean, we spend a lot of time talking to patient groups, and they, they do find the design of the spaces, instruments, systems that they encounter very intimidating. Jeremy, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut it yeah. short, but thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And we're going to move on. Okay, thank you.